Hello everyone, I'm Kumari Beck, Associate Professor in the Faculty of Education at Simon Fraser University. I'm really sorry we cannot meet in person. I was so looking forward to this conference, but I hope we can meet up someday soon. And until then, I'd like to thank you, Sharon, for this opportunity to get us started. First and always, I'm an uninvited guest and an immigrant settler on this land where I live here in Fort Langley. And I benefit daily from being able to own stolen land of the Kwantlen people by the banks of the Fraser. I'm grateful also to be working at three campuses that are located on unceded territories of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Squamish, Slavertooth, Coquitlam, and the Semiama. I'd like to start with George Floyd. In this session designated to race, in these times, it is important to recognize the pain of Black people and the explosion of police violence against Black and Indigenous peoples, a violence, as we know, that is lodged firmly in the fabric of our society by white supremacy, state oppression, and capitalist systems writ large. I'd like to share a poem dedicated to George Floyd by a Canadian poet of Jamaican ancestry, Olive Senior, and to remember also the racism and violence faced by Black, Indigenous, and people of color here in Canada. It is not just a US problem. It takes one's breath away. A man dying during a pandemic takes away one's breath. No ventilator but one brave spectator recording his last breath, his need. Please, somebody. Taking the knee on the neck from men who from birth breathed in tainted air, imbibed a foul history, burning crosses, still smoldering. I can't breathe. Like the hot breath of anger consuming the cities that inhaled this before, this white heat, this burning sensation in the throats of the numerous ones held down, and Mama, Mama, I can't. Come on, George Floyd. Breathe in the timeless rhythm of Mother Earth waiting for you, for all her lost children, for justice. I am through. I am through. So this latest police-involved death has resulted in multiple protests across the country. And we heard the chief commissioner of the RCMP denying systemic racism in the institution. Of course, that was backtracked following the reactions of the prime minister and other leaders just two days later. Anishinaabe author and journalist Tanya Talaga was one of many calling for justice. I would like to briefly explore some ideas that may help us to take up that call and to understand in greater depth what it means for our work as scholars in critical internationalization studies, and in particular, the interconnections among nation building, racialization, and internationalization. In Canada, we know that formal education has always served as an assimilationist tool designed by the dominant groups to impose cultural conformity upon subordinated groups by eliminating the latter's cultural heritage. In this process, racism and sexism as ideology were entrenched as normal and rational ways of doing things. The displacement of indigenous peoples, the exploitation of their labor, their power, their knowledge, their sexuality, and their assimilation through Christian education were seen as common sense practices. So treating racism and sexism as common sense draws attention to the norms and forms of action that have become 
ordinary ways of doing things of which we have little consciousness so that certain things, as Roxana Eng says, disappears from the social surface. And so designing education in a certain way, as Walensky points out, has also become, in a certain way, common sense. And it has shaped the way we regard uh, international relations and their evolution also as being common sense. Hence, the importance of critical internationalization studies that interrogate the idea and the taken for granted conceptions of, of internationalization as being good for everyone. So these are some illustrations of, first of all, why we may not come across race in, on our campuses or the acknowledgement that race is an issue, but also why it is important to take it up in our scholarship. So first, let me start with the other two have already been explained, but for democratic racism, Henry and Taylor discuss the moral tensions inherent in spaces like the university, spaces dominated by dominant white culture where on the one hand, democratic liberal values form the foundation of the academy, the university, while on the other hand, racialized discourse, thought, and practice are allowed to continue unabated, impinging on the education and the very lives of racialized members of the academy. So the moral tension is that there are everyday experiences and lived reality of racialized students and faculty, and juxtaposed against this, are the perception and responses of those who have the power to redefine that reality, that is, white educators and administrators in the university. So democratic racism then is an ideology in which two conflicting sets of values are made congruent to each other. Commitments to democratic principles such as equality, fairness, and justice conflict with, but also coexist with, negative feelings about racialized individuals and groups and discrimination against them. So one of the con consequences of this conflict is a lack of support for policies and practices that might improve the relatively low status of racialized communities. So there's a strong resistance to seeing racism as anything but the abhorrent behavior of a small number of individuals. And more importantly, Efforts to dismantle racialized systems and structures lack legitimacy according to the egalitarian principles of liberal democracy. So on to the lived reality. Racism experienced in multiple ways. And experiences such as these are common, but they are hard to present as experiences of racism because they don't fit the common, ugly, racist slur or the stereotypical go home, although that has changed in pandemic times. You can see from this particular response that there's a sort of a victim blaming, blaming in the sense that the one who feels the negative effects of inequality is the one who is burdened with overcoming that discrimination. And in particular with this view expressed here, that the difficulty and the hardship that comes from these differences cited as a temporary disadvantage, whose these are normal, and these effects can be lessened over time and can even lead to an advantage. So there's no room to validate the lived experience of racialized students and faculty. Another example that we've had here um, in the field of international education are the national surveys on international student satisfaction. We can note the framing of this question. So 1999 had a, had a question on racism and the way participants were asked to respond to this was to agree or disagree with this statement. I have not experienced any form of racism or discrimination as an international student in Canada. So first of all, do participants understand what constitutes racism and discrimination? And rather than state the results as 
28% of students experience racism and discrimination is simply recorded as 28% disagreed with the statement. Five years later, the percentages are down by 3%, but they also note that students from Africa faced higher levels of racism. And so the subsequent CBIE surveys don't, they drop the questions about race, but what disturbs me is that their conclusions overall is that what matters most from the overall, from the surveys that over 75% of students had a positive experience and that the majority of them, over 85%, would choose Canada as their first place of study. Another um, example was the controversial and hideous, rather hideous article published by McLean's in their Guide to Canadian Universities is 2010, in 2010. Um, so this was basically an interview with mostly white students about what they would choose, how they would choose, what university they would choose to attend. And so the, just like to focus on this changing headline. So at first it was called Too Asian and why some frosh don't want to study at an Asian university. And then the other one was Too Asian, so added a question mark, but then with all the um, the backlash and the critiques that were received. Um, just two days later, the whole article was entitled The Enrollment Controversy Worries that efforts in the US to limit enrollment of Asian students in top universities may migrate to Canada. So to date, no apology or no detraction was made by the authors, nor the Monroe McLean's. And in their later article, they actually explain that calling it too Asian is not about racism but it's about how white students believe that competing with Asians requires a sacrifice of time and freedom that they're not willing to make. Um, yeah, the, the entire article, if you care to check it out, is very problematic. And so the article did produce a lot of scholarship um, on the issue, um, but let me change that on the topic, but racism, as a problem is still not recognized and in fact is delegated to a few bad apples. And this book, by the way, uh, by local um, scholars is a, a very good um, one for challenging all that goes on. Um, okay, so the next issue, the illustration that I have is a branding of Canada as being a happy place for international students. So Canada is multicultural um, as e uh, the equivalent being, there is no racism here. Um, most university websites, in fact, every single one of them and the Edu Canada brand on the federal website leads with promoting this multicultural country. Um, and of course, as Chic and St. Dennis very powerfully identify, let me move this up again is that when power relations are not acknowledged in the production of racial identities in the nation, not only are minorities um, blamed for the effects of racism, but in contrast, the rhetoric of multiculturalism is enacted as a symbol of the good nation. We argue that the celebration of cultural difference and the narrative of the nation is raceless, benevolent, and innocent as implications for the reproduction of racial privilege, but more and, and beyond that for our, our field of studies, that internationalization is also, and our campuses are raceless, benevolent, and innocent. So this um, leads me to actually uh, extend this to how websites and universities are looking at image management in this regard. And as Ahmed very um, powerfully describes it, that diversity then becomes more about changing perceptions of whiteness rather than changing the whiteness of organizations. And everything then becomes a matter of image management. So connecting back to the structures of colonial power um, that get covered up in the so-called intercultural relations that are touted through multiculturalism and internationalization. Um, and also it's important to, to look at the work of Homi Baba, who actually talks about 
in multicultural societies, at the, along with the creation of this diversity, there occurs a containment of cultural difference as dominant cultures accommodate others only within their own norms and frames. So we invite the world to our universities. Um, and then we actually construct international students along with their attitudes, expectations, their classroom experiences and interactions as being the bearers of culture. And yet their cultural differences are mostly contained as we impress upon our students, certainly here in Canada, about um, the monolingualism as opposed to, yeah, the encouragement of diversity. And this othering, I mean, in this particular two quotes um, from the piles of data that I have from my, suit, from my research as being the foreigner and the, the image of international students as being of a deficit, this is all I can do. And then, you know, as Naomi says, I recognize myself as being worthless as a student here. And so as another student said, it's just the facade of showing international. The discourses of equal opportunity, diversity, and inclusiveness may have opened the doors of universities to racialize indigenous students, faculty, and staff, but this has not changed the cultural values, norms, and practices of the hegemonic power structures within institutions accounting for systemic racism reflected in policies, practices, attitudes, and behaviors. In a great example of interest convergence, um, we now have in Canada the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Initiative, now mandated for all universities. And this has promoted a great enthusiasm for seeking to understand the student experience through, of course, the liberal values of openness, fairness, and tolerance, and how our university leaders make their commitment to being champions of EDI. And there's this public commitment to these seven principles of equity, diversity, inclusion, including the usual rhetoric around enriching our spaces with diversity um, and the commitment to equity of access and opportunity, um, integrating inclusive excellence, whatever that means. Um, and again, addressing barriers and obstacles um, that may discourage members of underrepresented groups to advance, um, and again, touting the excellence, um, diversity and inclusive excellence. And of course, using Sarah Ahmed's work, it is, of course, um, shown how all this rhetoric becomes non-performative. Um, statements of a co commitment appear to commit the institution to doing something where the institution is imagined as a subject but also how it blocks the recognition of the harms. Again, the recognition that, for example, in our uh, example of racism, of why that commitment is needed in the first place. So in other words, by making a commitment to EDI, how can we be racist or discriminatory? And so these kinds of statements can be understood as non-performatives when they are not doing what they are saying. And so I'd like to leave you with that thought for now, with the assertion that our scholarship in critical internationalization studies in moving towards, I think what Sharon and others have called reimagining, but also to as internationalization otherwise, I think must include um, a space and a recognition of the importance of interrogating and addressing and dismantling race and racism in our institutions.